last couple of weeks, uh, we've been going through the Ten Commandments, and we're going to continue on that today. We'll be studying together the Second Commandment. Uh, I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Uh, that's where you find the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. If you didn't bring your own Bible, uh, we're not only going to look at this passage, but a couple of others. I think it may help to have a Bible in front of you. You can find a Bible in the chairs around you, and if you do, turn to page 54, where you'll find uh, this passage, Exodus 20. We're going to read uh, the first two commandments, starting with the prologue, and then uh, begin to dig in a little bit. And um, this really is the center or the heart of our worship service. We believe that God uh, is here with us, and he speaks to us through his word. And, and as we read, this is the very word of God to us today. Uh, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 20, we read, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And then the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. If you were here last week, we, we talked together about how this commandment, uh, it has as its basis this idea that we're in a relationship with God. That, that God is a God who speaks, that he desires to be in a relationship with us. And uh, the Ten Commandments are really uh, how this relationship is going to work and how it's going to be structured and uh, the very first thing God says is, is there can't be someone else in the way of this relationship. You can't take on other lovers. God has to be first priority, number one. And if our relationship with God is going to work, that, that's the way it has to be. Uh, that was the first commandment. Today we're going to concentrate on the second, beginning in verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And just to get started, in the middle of verse 5, I want to draw your attention to, to this line, for I, the Lord your God, am a, the word here is jealous God. The Hebrew word for jealous is actually, um, it, it means something like for your face to turn red. And um, the idea is something like this. If you've ever been in a relationship where, where something has, has come in the way and it, it's going to break that relationship up and, and it's just so valuable and you see it slipping out and you're, you just burn almost with, with jealousy, your face just beat red. Uh, that's the kind of, of passion or emotion that, that's behind this word. And I just draw to your attention that, again, this is more relationship language, this idea that, that God wants this relationship with us, and he's got this burning, even if you will, passion, if there be anything that, that gets in our, our way of that. Um, at any rate, uh, beginning back here at verse 4, this is the heart of the commandment, says, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. So at the heart of this commandment, there is this, this command that when it comes to the worship of God, we, we shouldn't be making a statue, uh, whether that statue looks like anything up in the, the heavens above, or, or whether that statue or carving or image looks like anything that we might experience here on earth, or, or even in the waters below. Like when it comes to the worship of God, uh, we shouldn't be forming or fashioning some shape, image, statue, uh, idol uh, as we approach God to worship. There's a, a key passage in the Old Testament. I'm going to have you turn there with me. It's Deuteronomy chapter 4 that helps us to understand uh, the heart of this commandment. I'm going to start reading in verse 10. You can find that on page 128. Um, as you're turning there, let me just give a little bit of context to this. Uh, undoubtedly, by now, you, you, you must know the, the story of the Israelites, that they were slaves in Egypt, and God called this man Moses, and Moses was to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, and he went, and Pharaoh at first wouldn't let the people go, but, but then God sent all these flags, and finally Pharaoh let them go, and, and they escaped, they crossed the Red Sea, and, and right away, as they become free, they, they gather around this mountain called Mount Horeb, or sometimes called Mount Sinai, where God speaks to them now, okay, we're in a relationship here, we're together now, here's how it's going to work. These are the Ten Commandments. Uh, so that's nearly right away after they leave Egypt. Of course, uh, as you continue to read the story forward, you realize that um, they didn't really listen that well. They kind of fell apart. They, they didn't have this passion for God that they ought to have had, even though they'd seen all the miraculous things that God had done. And uh, as a result, 
God uh, actually had them wander around in the desert for some 40 years while the first generation of them all died out. And so for 40 years, they just wandered, and, and God in the desert taught them all these lessons about what it means to be in a relationship with him and who he was. And at the end of those 40 years, just now, they're ready to enter into the promised land. Before they get there, they stop, and Moses delivers this sermon, which basically recalls everything that had happened and what they learned about God. And uh, the book of Deuteronomy is that final sermon just before they enter into the promised land, recalling everything they've learned. And I I'm just going to begin reading in verse 10 of chapter 4, and, and this, this part just recalls some of what we had just talked about. It says, Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, or Mount Sinai, when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens, with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form. There was only a voice. Now, if you're the kind of person who takes notes, you may just take a note here and highlight, underline, whatever, verse, verse 12. It's very important. These words, God spoke and said, you heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. So, so when God appeared, there was, there was fire and there was billowing smoke. But when they looked up, and God was speaking to them, there was no image they saw. There was no shape. There was no, there was no form they only heard a voice. This passage goes on. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow, and then wrote them on two stone tablets. And the Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you are to follow in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You saw no form of any kind the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. So you hear the repetition of that, right? Like, Look, when you looked up, there wasn't anything that form, shape, image. There's nothing there. You just heard the voice. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman, like an animal on earth or any bird that flies in the air or like any creature that moves along the ground or any fish in the waters below. And when you look up to the sky and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven. So, so the basic idea here is, look, you know, in that time, in Israel's history, all the other nations of the world had these variety of gods that they followed. And what they were in the custom of doing is something like this, that let's just say they followed this God over here, they, they would try to picture what that God was like, and they would create some idol or statue. They'd carve it out of wood or stone, and, and they'd put it there, and, and in order to worship that God, they, they would bow down to this image, because this image, in some way, this, this statue represented the, the God of that nation. Um, and Moses is saying, look, God is not like that that you can reduce him down to some image or idol, whether it's some animal or some bird or, or even the sun. Or, I mean, don't do that. God is not like that. When you were there, you saw no form. You just heard his voice. So worship God according to his words, not some picture that you might imagine of him. I, I want to add to that. I, in order to kind of push this a little farther, I'd have you turn to another passage. We'll just go backwards here in the book of Exodus. Uh, Exodus chapter 33. So the basic idea there is like, you know, there was no form, there was no image, there was no shape, just his word. And uh, don't do what the other nations do. Uh, Exodus 33, so... So God brought them out. He assembled them at, at Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb. He, he gave them the Ten Commandments. And uh, then if you kind of read the story of Moses, Moses had a tough time with these people. I mean, they were obstinate. They were always whining. They were crying. We should just go back. And at some point, Moses is like wearing out. He's like, okay, God, I'm doing this, but help out here a little bit. And at some point, he, he, he says to God, he's like, look, you know, I'm doing this all for you, but, but I'd like to see you. Could, could you show yourself to me? And we're going to pick up here in verse 18 of chapter 33. This is where Moses requests this. Moses said to God, Now, 
Show me your glory. Like, I, I need to behold and see you so that I, I get strengthened to keep going here. And this is God's response, verse 19. The Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I'll proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I'll put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Now, in order to kind of clarify this passage, I think it's important to point out that um, this passage uses what might be called anthropomorphisms. Like when you think of God, no, no person who's read the Bible or understood who God is has ever thought that he literally has a hand or he literally has a face, or he literally has a back as though he's composed of body parts like we are. Uh, this is just a, a way of speaking so that we can understand who he is. So when God says, I'm going to cover you with my hand, you ought not to think that there's you know, some literal hand that comes down out of the sky. Uh, instead, this idea of God's hand, it, it, often, it often is connected to the idea of a, a shield, that God's hand is going to be a shield. And so the idea here is God said, okay, I'm going to cause my glory to pass by, but you're not going to be able to see me at all. And I'm going to, in some way or another, I'm going to put you in a cleft of a rock and shield you from, from seeing me. And when God speaks of his face, he's not talking about eyes and a nose and a mouth as though there's a literal face. Throughout the Bible, the face of God represents his presence. And he basically says, nobody can come into my presence and live. Uh, when God speaks about his back, he says, I'm going to cause all my glory to pass by. You're not going to see my face. You'll see my back. Um, in, in the Hebrew way of thinking, uh, if you were to see someone's back, like if I was to just walk out that door in the back right now, and the last thing you'd see before I left, it would be my back, right? And then, I, then I'd be gone. Like the idea here is something like this, that uh, God's saying, I'll cause all my glory to pass by, and then I'll remove my hand, and you'll see the place where I just was. And the implication is, that will blow your mind. Like, if you could just see the place where God just was, like, that'll be way more than you need, Moses. So, so Deuteronomy speaks about how when God appeared to the people, that there was no shape, there was no form, there was only a voice. In this passage, God, you, you can't see me. If you see the place where I just was, like, that'll blow your mind, be way more than what you can handle. Um, now, to push this a little farther, what, I, what I'd like to do is just talk about who God is. And uh, actually, one of, one of my goals today is not to just impart information, but um, it would be that we would leave today with a sense of, like, awe and majesty and reverence when we think about who God is. And so I'd like to talk about God in relationship to time and space. Let's just start with time. I'm going to put a scripture passage up here on the screen. It comes from Psalm 90, uh, just the first two verses. It says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That word everlasting, uh, the Hebrew word is the word olam. And it refers to, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, indefinite time. And let me see if I can kind of explain this a little bit. So every one of us, uh, we had a day we were born, and at some point we'll have a day that we die. You know, these are the dates that we could put on our, our, our gravestone or our tombstone. Um, and every person who's ever lived has this beginning point and ending point. So Napoleon, he had the day he was born, he had the day he died. Uh, Moses ha had the day he was born, the day he died. And if we took a timeline from the beginning of history all the way up until now, we could plot out our beginnings and our ends. These are definite, distinct periods of time uh, that we have. God is not like that. He doesn't have these definite periods of time. He he's indefinite. Um, another way of thinking about this word olam, 
Um, it means something like beyond the vanishing point. So if you were to look out, go outside and look out and, and see the horizon, it's like where the earth and sky meet and just beyond that, beyond that vanishing point, uh, you can't see anymore. Uh, the idea is olam is beyond that. And um, the writers of, of this scripture, uh, it's, it's as though they're saying as far back as we can even conceive, God's beyond that. So, so they draw up before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world. Like what happened before that? What, what's ever, that's like our vanishing point, olam. That's where, where God is. Or as far forward as you can look in the future, like as far as we might be able to foresee until there's like a vanishing point, uh, the idea is from olam to olam, from everlasting to ever, like God is beyond that, as far backwards and as far forwards indefinitely as we can even begin to conceive. We, are, we just have these definite periods of time from here to there. But God's not like that. As far backwards and as far forwards as we can even begin to imagine or think. God is beyond that. That's his relationship to time. And I'd like to now talk about his relationship to, to space. I'm going to put another scripture passage up here on the screen. It comes from John chapter 4. And let me just set this up a little bit. Um, Jesus uh, was traveling through an area called Samaria, and he meets the Samaritan woman. And as he meets her, he instantly has knowledge of who she is and begins to reveal all these personal details about her life that just astound and amaze her. Like, how, how do you know that? And uh, rather than like facing up to what it is that Jesus is revealing, she decides she wants to start this theological conversation with him. And uh, the conversation boils down to a question of worship. Uh, in that day... Uh, Jewish people had the temple on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and that's where they went to worship, on Mount Zion. Uh, Samaritans had another place where they set up a temple. It was called Mount Gerizim, and they went there to worship. And uh, this woman, because she's a Samaritan and Jesus is Jewish in background, decides that she's going to ask this theological question, like, okay, look, you know, where is the right place? Like, where should I go to find God, should we be going to Mount Zion or Mount Gerizim? And she says, look, I know you're a prophet. You know all these things about me. Where should we go? And uh, Jesus, when he responds, it's as though he shakes his head. He's like, you don't get it, do you? And, and then he says this, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Like he's don't, you don't get it, do you? Like you think somehow that God's like we are, has this physical location, is material, and is either in one place or the other. But but that's not what it, he's a spirit. And, and there'll come a time where every true worshiper uh, will realize you've got to worship in spirit and in truth. Um, thinking about this a little bit, I, I'd like to have you put on your philosophy caps. And we're gonna try, I'm going to try something to talk to you about the philosophy of things. Uh, we could actually spend an entire semester in a college philosophy course talking about things. What makes something a thing? Uh, let's just see if we could kind of boil it down. So uh, many of you did not know I picked up a new talent. This instrument's called a cajon. It is a thing. Uh, I've got another thing over here. Let's see. I've got the, my Bible. Okay, so this is, you agree, this is one thing and this is another, right? Like some of you, if you don't agree, they're like, I don't know, there's no help, I can't. <laughs> but we know this is one thing and this is another. And um, there's all kinds of philosophical discussions, like what makes this a thing and that a separate thing? And I'll just try to boil down to some kind of basic things we can all agree about. What makes this a thing is that it has edges, right? And boundaries which define where it starts and where it ends. Uh, there are edges and boundaries. This thing has edges and boundaries. This thing has edges and boundaries. Where this thing leaves off, there's air, and then at some point the edge or boundary of this thing starts up, and, and it has edges and boundaries which define its area. And everything in our material world 
takes up some space with its edges and boundaries. Kind of deep, right? Some of you go, whoa. <laughs> That's as far as we're going today. <laughs> Things have edges and bound people, like the way we are with our bodies. Like I, I stretch my left hand all the way out and I stretch my right hand all the way out and you can see that I take up a certain amount of area. I, I start over here, I end over here. I have my edges and boundaries which define the space that I take up. The material world is like that. God is not. It's not as though he, he just is confined to one location or one locale. Even with regard to space, from everlasting to everlasting. You can't, you can't think of God as just reduced down to one locale, one physical location. Okay, I'm going to try something. This is either going to work or I'm going to lose everybody, but, but let's just, everybody can find a piece of paper. Okay, you got to have this piece of paper ready. So um, you probably walked out the door today, you looked up at the sky, I mean, you probably looked around, and, and you could have said to yourself, like, what a world we live in. I mean, what a world. You know, it, it's so huge to us. You could travel this world over. You'd find new things all the time. You could live your entire life on the goal. You would never exhaust this world. It's a huge place, right? Uh, here's a picture. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. A picture of the planet Earth compared to some of the other planets in our solar system. You got Venus and Mars and Mercury and Pluto. And, and when you put it up next to some of the other planets, you're like, that's right. That's our home, baby. It's huge, right? Uh, let me put, it, put a picture up here with some other planets. Okay, I don't know if you can see this or not. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. I mean, that little ball is where all our lives take place, every triumph, tragedy, every emotion that we ever feel, it all takes place on this little globe. Okay, I'm going to put another picture up here. This is a picture of all our planets compared to the size of our sun. Those of you in the back have probably lost planet Earth. It's a fifth from the right. This Pluto is like a tiny little dot. I mean, hopefully, as you think, I like... We live there. Everything we're doing is being lived right now is being lived out on that small. Didn't you know our sun is only one of many, many stars in our galaxies? I'm going to put a picture here up on the screen that just shows to scale some of our nearest neighbor stars. See where the sun is? We've got Octurus, Pollux, Sirius. These are just some of our nearest neighbors. There's the sun. Jupiter is now, you can't even see it, much less the earth. And uh, I don't know if you realize this, but uh, our, our galaxy, which is called the Milky Way galaxy, scientists now say there's something like 200 billion stars in just our galaxy alone. And uh, here's, here's a picture of uh, just, forget our neighbors, look at some of the other stars that are there. See where Octurus is now? Okay, you ready for the piece of paper? So here's what I want you to do. This piece of paper probably ha has a, a length and, and a width, but I want you to look at the edge of it. You know, you might have to close one eye and take a good look. Okay, here's what I want you to imagine now. The distance from our Earth to the sun is 93 million miles. That's a long way. And let's just suppose that the edge of the piece of paper that's in front of you represented 93 million miles. Okay, so, so you, if you had like a tiny little car that could drive 93 million miles per hour, hopefully it'd get good gas mileage. If it could drive 93 million miles an hour, it'd take one hour for that tiny little car to go from one side of this edge to the other. So just this piece of paper, imagine it was 90, the distance from Earth to Sun. Okay, now, suppose you're wanting to go from our Sun to the nearest star. You know how many pieces of paper you'd have to stack up to represent that distance? You would stack up papers so tall that it'd be about 88 feet high just to go to the nearest star. OK? 
okay? Which is a long way. And I told you that we belong to a, a galaxy called the Milky Way. Suppose uh, on these 200 billion stars, you wanted to go from one edge to the other, and uh, you needed to stack up pieces of paper to represent that distance. You would have to make a stack 365 miles tall, just from one edge of our galaxy to the other. I mean, I, I don't know, can you picture 365? Okay, but uh, here's what scientists have figured out, that our universe is so much bigger. They now say there's something like 100 billion galaxies in our universe. Suppose you wanted to travel from our galaxy to just the next closest one, and you wanted to stack up papers to kind of represent how far that would be. Scientists have figured this out. They say you would need a stack of paper about 7,300 miles tall, which is about the diameter of the Earth. So if you were to take a piece of paper and you just stack them up this way, and you're just to head out and go all the way around the world and come back, that's just to get to our nearest neighbor. Remember, this is 93 million miles, this piece of paper. You didn't know how awesome your piece of paper was in your hand. 93, okay. Science is now 100 billion galaxies. That's how long it would take just to get to the closest one. Suppose you are now going to travel from what scientists say is the edge of the known universe to the other edge of the known universe. Like how many pieces of paper would you need then? You ready for this? Scientists say you would need about 76 million miles of paper stacked up, which if you're kind of now keeping track, is almost the distance from the Earth to the Sun, just to go from one end of the known universe to the other, and that's just what we know. So as, and the idea is this, like as far out as you could think in one direction, and as far out as you could think in the, like as much as you can conceive, God is olam. He's beyond the vanishing point in either direction. I just want you, as you think about this universe that God created, what kind of God is this that, that beyond one end to the other, he is God? Like I told you, my, my goal today is just produce some reverence and awe. Like, what kind of God creates that? Do you know you can go in the other direction? Uh, try this for me. Just put your finger out in front of you and um, imagine a speck of dust on it. You know, a tiny speck of dust. It's about as small, I mean, some of you could just, you know. It's about as small as we can imagine, right? So here's the thing. At the turn of the 19th century, the end of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s, scientists realized that there were these things called atoms. And they came to understand that in one speck of dust, there is something like three trillion atoms that make up that one speck of dust. So, I mean, next time you have a speck of dust actually in your hand, just look, whoa, three trillion of those atoms are there. And at the time... When scientists figured that out, they said, that is it. That is the smallest thing there is in this entire universe, this atom. You want to know what happened, though? At the turn of the 20th century, so at the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, scientists actually came to realize that those atoms that they thought, like, that's the smallest thing, were not the smallest thing. And they came to realize that those atoms were made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and when they made that discovery, they said, now that is the building block. That is the smallest thing. So all those three trillion atoms in there all made up themselves of protons, neutrons, and electrons. They said, now we've got it. That's as small as you could go. Well, then came the year 1950. And you want to know what happened in the 1950s? Scientists are kind of probing and, and, and trying to figure out these protons and neutrons when they discover that they are made up of baryons and mesons. You know, all that little speck of dust. So like barons and mesons make up protons and neutrons, and, and those make up atoms. And they thought, well, that baby is as small as you could take it until about 10 years later in the 1960s. Scientists came along and they said, you know those barons and mesons? Those are actually made up of things called quarks. Some of you are like, I just graduated a couple days ago. I didn't know I'd be back in chemistry class. 
It's like those of you who, who just like threw your chemistry book in a pond never to do it again, I'm sorry. So then there are these like tiny little quarks. And, and you made me think to yourself, well, that is as small as it could go. And you know, in the last few years, they have these, uh, you know, subatomic accelerators where they're trying to figure out the properties of atoms and things that are smaller. And they just found out that those quarks are made up of things called prions. And right now, prions are like all the rage in physics because those tiny little prions make up the quarks that make up all the baryons and mesons that make up the protons and neutrons that make up the atoms, three trillion of which are in a speck of dust. And you know, I don't know this for sure, but I get this idea based on everything I just told you that maybe like 50 or 100 years from now, there's going to be science who are like prions. Those are like mountains. They're like mountains of material. And I just ask yourself the question, who is this God who can stretch out the heavens from one end to the other? Just vast ideas that we can't begin to comprehend who at the same time is creating prions and neutrons and quarks and from the hugest, vast realms to the tiniest detail. From Olam to Olam. What kind of God is this? And the heart of this commandment is this. Like, this God who does that, don't think to yourself that he's some kind of thing that you can carve out carry around, manipulate, and cause to do your bidding. Like, if you come to realize who this God is, you're not going to make a statue of him and carry him around and think, like, okay, he'll do what I want now. Does that make sense? Like, don't think of me like that, God says. When I showed up, I, I didn't look like something in your experience. I'm God. I'm not a thing. This commandment, by the way, is all about how we relate to God. It's all about worship. And if you come to see who God for who he is, how he reveals himself in, this, in his word, it's like, if we're going to be just filled with reverence and awe and worship, when we think of this God who stretches out the galaxies and who cares for the details of the tiniest quarks and prions, now, trying to bring this home a little bit. Uh, truth of the matter is this. Uh, I wasn't concerned at all that there was anyone who was going to come here today who was even tempted to go home and make a statue of God. Uh, I wasn't concerned that, you know, any of you had this idea like, okay, I'm going to make a little statue of God and carry it. Like, probably none of us are there. Uh, but I'd suggest to you that although none of us are doing that today, there are all kinds of ways in which we're still reducing God and diminishing him from the reality of who he is. And I thought maybe to kind of end it, um, we could just talk a little bit about that. So I suggest to you, uh, Christians sometimes talk about how God ha has made this God-sized hole in our heart that can only be filled with him. And the idea of, the, of this thought is this, that God's actually left this hole in our heart that it, if we try and fill it with anything other than the vastness of his majesty, we'll never be satisfied. But you know what? That doesn't stop us from trying. I mean, I, I have. I'm sure most of us were tempted all the time to, to do something like that. You know, some of us, sometimes we find ourselves in a relationship and that relationship, we just it's so big to us that we think, oh, you know what? I don't need you, God, because I've got this relationship and I'll just stuff that there in that hole and I'll be fine. Or some of us, we, we try to stuff it with things. Like we sense this hole that's there. And so we think, well, if I just have enough money or maybe if I get that boat or maybe if I, I entertain myself, like I'll just... And, and we make God a lot smaller than he is when we imagine that that hole in our heart can be filled with, with those kinds of things. Only God can. He must be first. And you think about who he is. I'm giving you another idea. This is another thing that I thought of. I think there are ways in which sometimes we really reduce God when we don't live according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I think so often, here, here's the thing, so, so most of us at some point or another, we come to recognize that we're sinners. We don't live up to what God wants. And so here's what we do. Rather than treating God like God, we, we kind of come to him and, and we think, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll relate to you, God, on my terms. And so we begin to bargain with him. We begin to negotiate with him. We say, well, I'll do this for you, God, and I'll do that, and then we'll be cool, right? Like, I won't do this. I will do that. And, and we start negotiating with God on our terms. And one of the things, once you realize who God is, you'll come to realize that that is ridiculous. It just reduces God. You know, we'd like to carry God around and, and think like, you know what, I control him, I manipulate him, I'm in charge of him. And once you realize who God is, that, that's ridiculous. Like, we can't come to God on our terms. And so here's the thing, because of our sin, God actually shows up on his terms in the person of Jesus. And he sent his son to, to pay the price for those sins. And there's a verse in the Bible where Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And so often we bristle at that and we say, well, come on, Ken, I'd like to come to you on my terms, my way. You know, uh, at, the, at the bottom line, the Bible says we have to have faith. And I think faith really boils down to a, a very simple idea, which is this. At some point, we must surrender, which is to acknowledge reality, truth. He is God. I am not. Does that make sense? I mean, we like to think that we're totally in charge, that we can come on our terms, but he is God. I am not. Which means at some point, we stop trying to manipulate, trying to control trying to pretend that we'll carry him around. And we just acknowledge the truth. He's God. And I surrender. And I think actually what happens when we acknowledge the truth and realize, whoa, it's like our hearts get filled with this, this awe and reverence and worship for who God is and what he's done in Jesus. And uh, Jesus at some point when he was talking with this woman about it, he said this, true worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. And my hope is as we leave today, we just go with this spirit of worship, recognizing who God is in all his awe and all his majesty, worshiping him in our spirit and in truth.